Thanks everybody for coming. Um, so you're in the right place. This is a soil health and organic farming systems uh, workshop. Um, my name's Ben Bull. I work for Oregon Tilt, and I'm going to be speaking a little bit at the end of the presentation, but uh, really excited to have our two main speakers here with us. We have, first off is going to be Coach Smallwood, who's the um, executive director from the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania, and he'll be uh, describing more about his work, and we're excited to hear him. And then after um, Coach talks, we have Doug Collins from Washington State University Extension, who's been doing some really great work there that we'll get to hear about as well. So um, so I'll turn it over to Coach. We can get thank started. You. So um, thank you all. I um, Lessons learned growing up from my mother in particular is uh, that you always say thanks in the beginning. You know, when you, when you get there, say thank you. So thank you all for having me. I'll say thanks at the end too, but she would be uh, upset with me. She still sends me gloves and, I mean, I'm like 59 years old. I was like, Mom, I, I'm, I can get gloves myself, it's okay. She's very cute, she's uh, 85 now, so um, I, I honor her by following her rules. So I've been a beekeeper for, let me back up. I'm going to go into a lot of different things that we do at Rodale so you have an understanding for the Institute. I think that's important. I will focus on soil health, of course. But one of the things we do is our honeybee conservancy. And we think we have lots of lessons learned from the bees. I'm in my 20th year of beekeeping. We have a research project now that will begin at, at Rodale this coming season. And I'd like to talk about the bees as a great indicator of the health of the environment. Back in the 1940s, there were approximately 7 million hives in the United States. Currently, about 2 million hives in the United States. So if the bees are a great indicator of the health of the environment, we really need to take a lesson and, and listen to what they're telling us. Uh, their uh, honeybees in particular are, are in trouble. They're in decline, and there's lots of reasons that we think are possibilities. So is it the way they're treated, you know, traveling across the country? Is it what they're feeding them? Is it how they... Um, are exposed to pesticides? Is it GMOs? Is it UFOs? I mean, it could be a combination of them all. Right now, in the, in the US, uh, soon, about Valentine's Day, they need 1.2 million hives to pollinate the almond trees in California. Did you hear the number that I gave you before? There's 2 million hives in the whole United States. And in a few days, 1.2 of those 2 million will be in California. So what we're doing with the bees is, is certainly something that we need to reflect on. But here's what I reflect on. Uh, this day, I was opening some of my hives and inspecting. It was a springtime and um, that's a, that's a frame, that's one frame. There's about 2,000 bees on that frame. I pulled two frames out and they were glued together with uh, what they call uh, bridge wax. And it's really a good idea to break them apart and look at them individually. I'm looking for the queen, I'm looking for day old eggs sitting up in that cell. And I made a mistake, it was my fault. I was working the frames apart and I dropped one. And so now I have 2,000 bees at my feet and I have 2,000 bees in my hand and they communicate with one another immediately. Something to the effect, uh, who is the idiot taking care of the hive today? This is not cool. And so they go into their defensive mode and you know what they do, they begin to sting me. So I got stung on the neck a couple of times and on my arms and I got this, frame back into the hive and it took me about an hour to get the other bees that were on the ground settled and also back into the hive. But I had an hour then to reflect on what it was 
they were teaching me that day. So the bees, as you know, they put the stinger into your skin and they fly off. And what happens? They die. They only get one sting, honeybees. Other insects will bite uh, yellow jackets. You know, they get up your sleeve. That's big trouble because they'll keep biting. Bees get one shot. So the lesson learned for me that day was that those bees were sacrificing their life for the rest of the colony. They gave up their life for the rest of the hive. They needed to move this person that didn't know what he was doing away. And it worked. And I'm not asking you to lay down in front of a bus that's spewing global warming gas. But I am asking you to consider how you can each day become a better steward for our hive. This is our colony. And so I have a trigger now that I use. Every day I put on green. I put on some green clothes every single day. I tell people at the Rodale Institute, if you ever see me without green clothes, I'll give you $100. I have a lot more green clothes than $100 bills. So that's my trigger though. I put on green and it makes me consider the start of my day as being the best steward for my colony as I possibly can be. And my goal is always to be a better steward today than I was yesterday, every day. And then I go outside for the first time in the morning and I thank all of the plants and all of the animals that were here before us because that's why we're here now. So I would just like you to sort of contemplate on that thought. Maybe consider, you know, what's your trigger going to be? And um, start buying some green clothes. <laughs> so this is, this is the Rodell Institute. We have 333 acres, founded in 1947. Um, we, uh, you'll, you'll see diversity in some of the photos that I'm going to run, run by you today. But this is where I go to work when I'm not traveling. And it is um, a very special place. Lots of great energy there. Uh, the Rodale family bought this particular farm in 1971, and uh, we are considered to be the birthplace of the organic movement. So wherever you see the word organic, whether it's on a product, the NOP, uh, an organization, we consider it all of those to be children and grandchildren of the Rodale Institute. This is our founder, J.I. Rodale. He also founded the publishing company, Rodale Incorporated, completely separate entities. He was very concerned with his own health back in 1940 when he moved to Pennsylvania, and he started to investigate our food system. And what he found out was after World War I, they began to systematically and completely change the way our food was being grown. Up until that time, our food was grown with a very well-known and very well-respected science called biology. And it was about life in the soil. After World War I, there were mountains of chemical fertilizer. Actually, it was munitions, ammonium nitrate, mountains of it available. And the chemical industry began to introduce it systematically and in a dominating way into our food system. And so now we have another system growing, growing food here in the US that's using another science, also well known and well respected, called chemistry. And so J.I. looked at the two systems, one biology, one chemistry, and he started to investigate how those two systems work and how it might affect his own health. And he read all of the greats, Eve Balfour, Rudolf Steiner, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, and he investigated and taught himself about agronomy. And everywhere he went, Weston Price, Sir Albert Howard, every one of them came backwards to the soil. And everywhere you had healthy soil, you had healthy food, and you had healthy people. Of course, he coined that phrase. 
So you have healthy soil. You see these people that have great bone structure, good teeth, living into their 90s and still riding the bike up the mountain. All the stories you hear about what healthy soil does for human health. And really, that's our quest. We have lots of research, and you're going to see some of it today concerning soil. We are researching healthy food, of course, but our ultimate goal is healthy people. And I tell everybody that we're trying to work our way out of a job. We want global human health. And when we get there, our job is done. Currently, job security is pretty solid. But we're not giving up. Here's Maria Rodale. Uh, this is my boss. She runs the um, publishing company now, and she's also co-chair of our board. Let me tell you a quick story about J.I. He loved books. He was a prolific writer, and magazines were his thing. So he cranked out Organic Gardening Magazine, Prevention Magazine. You see now uh, the company has Men's Health, Women's Health. There are pages and pages of titles that he was responsible for. Most of them were financial disasters, but he was very persistent and, and wouldn't give up. So one of my favorites he, he introduced back in the 60s, it was called, You're Wrong About That. <laughs> and it failed miserably. But about six months later, he, come out, he came out with another magazine. And it was called, You're Wrong About That Too. <laughs> Seriously. To give you some idea of how J.I.'s mind worked. So the family is still uh, very involved. Uh, again, Maria is our, our co-chair. Her daughter is now a board member, Maya Rodale, and uh, they, they are indeed um, supporters of what we do. And here again is what we're talking about today. This is, this is really the crux of the situation that we have to consider. We want to replace chemistry and biotechnology with biology. So yesterday, in the leadership forum, they asked me, um, give us a goal, give us an objective for 2015. And you know what mine was? Begin to systematically and completely eliminate toxins from our food system. Completely eliminate toxins from our food system. That's where I'm taking the Rodale Institute. We want to ban poison from our food system. It just doesn't make sense to us anymore, and we're not going to put up with it, and we need your help. And I'll show you how you can pitch in with us in the coming year. So. Uh, most of you understand what organic is. Uh, we like to mimic natural systems. We like to grow with nature, not against it. Biological methods, compost, crop rotations, you're going to see some of our, our methodologies and cultural practices today. So here's my version of conventional ag. This is what it's like. This is, we could say, a GMO crop. In the beginning, in the short term, it worked. It ran like hell. You didn't even have to whip it. How old are these horses, these thoroughbreds? Three years old. Kentucky Derby. They're, three, they're all three-year-olds. How long's the race? Two minutes. They're three years old. The race is two minutes. There's all kinds of handlers. They're fed steroids, special diets. This is a fragile animal. And that's what we say is happening with conventional ag. It's a fragile animal. It has special handlers. There are lots of things that have to be considered. And I think we have reached a point where the chemical agricultural system has reached negative return. Now, here's my version of organic. They work every day. 
They don't like it if you don't work. They get lazy if you don't work them. Anybody here drive animals? Okay, so we, we have an oxen team at the Rodell Institute. I bought them uh, last July. Lewis and Clark. <laughs> They're organic pioneers. Um, so uh, we, we drive oxen for uh, demonstration purposes. I bought these two boys, a uh, three-day-old and a four-day-old from the dairy farm next to us, and uh, they're in training now. So uh, typically, the, the oxen that is the nigh, that's the one closest to you, you walk alongside oxen when you drive them, and the off oxen is the one that's away from you. Our nigh oxen doesn't like to work that much. The off oxen is all fired up. He loves it. So right now, we're kind of always turning left. <laughs> and I don't tell anybody that that's a mistake. They, they think I'm doing creative plowing. <laughs> so some more photos of the farm. Uh, we have lots of uh, heritage breeds now. Everything that we raise in terms of livestock is uh, pasture-based. I brought livestock back to the farm three years ago when I arrived at Rodell in 2010. There hadn't been animals on the farm for 35 years. We're back. We are vertically integrating them into our systems. One of the things that we're doing this year for the first time is uh, actually integrating beef cattle into crop rotation. So we're going to do corn, soy, forage, beef. And we already know what's going to happen. After we m move the beef, up go the yields of corn, soy, and forage. And anybody that's doing that, you, you know that it works. We're just going to put data to it. We have a three-year scientific project that's not only going to prove it, but we're going to come back to organicology the year after next with, with good data. So again, some of our, our livestock, this is our dairy herd. That's Clark. That's one of our oxen. We started raising pigs three years ago also, large blacks, um, Tamworths, and old spots, all on pasture, and we just completed, it's, uh, we, we don't have any pigs in it yet, but we just completed a new state-of-the-art um, hog facility. It's a place for them to sleep and farrow. The rest of the time, they'll be on pasture, also rotating uh, forages for our piggies. We are planning on uh, 100 hogs this year. Our data shows that we net $500 per head. We have these pigs on land that is underutilized, and they thrive. We don't put them on land where we're going to grow a crop. We put them on land where we would never grow a crop, and they thrive there. And we make $500 a head, and I tell farmers, raise 100 hogs like we do, and there's a market for them. They're sold as soon as they're born, and we put $50,000 in our pants every, every year based on our, our hog operation. That's the main man right there. That's our, our boar hog, Houdini. He was an escape artist when we first got him, so... Some more of him. That's a large black. So a very interesting how, how they how they name animals, right? He's very large, and he's black. Now this guy will roll over and beg you to scratch his belly. He's the, just the biggest baby you ever saw. Follows you around as gentle as can be. And a lot of times you you talk to conventional farmers and you tell them you're going to jump into a pen where there's a boar hog. They think you're crazy. This guy comes over and rolls over so you can scratch his belly. That's the difference between this side and the organic side. We raise um, Nigerian dwarfs. If you're interested in trying goats, this is the way to go. They're small. They're very well behaved. Unlike a lot of the big um, Swiss dairy goats that like to escape, these guys stay inside the fence. They never have tried to get out, and I've, I've raised Sonnens and Toggenbergs, and I've, I've gotten those phone calls. Coach, can you please come down 
and get your goats off of my Cadillac <laughs> again. So this, this is the way to go if you want to try goats, real high butter fat and uh, extremely well behaved. Better than puppy dogs. Uh, we do uh, organic tulip festival every year at the farm. Uh, there's only one organic tulip grower in the United States. It's called Eco Tulips. If you want to do organic tulips, that's the grower. They're out of Virginia. They're good partners with us. Uh, this is actually the parking lot for our uh, organic apple festival. We have uh, 1,100 organic apple trees. We do greenhouse work, high tunnels, hoop houses. I'm trying to show you some diversity in terms of what we do. Small grains, of course. But one of our ultimate goals is to create a massive awakening. We want to get the message that organic is superior. Organic is the way that you become a better steward for that hive, our colony, grow organically. That's our commitment. But we need to get this message out to the masses. And so we're going beyond just the farm. We're actually getting involved in turf. Uh, we're training farmers and of course, uh, our, the backbone of what we do is research. Here's our honeybee conservancy. We do classes every year. We create what we think is the backyard hobby beekeeper. We feel that's the answer to recovering the health of the hives across the country. It's not mega beekeeping. We're talking about handfuls of hives. We have um, 18 hives right now. We're bringing on another 24 this year. And, and you know, we do everything uh, the same. It's always side by side. So this year we're gonna do 12 hives, conventional practices, and we're gonna do 12 hives, organic best practices. We have a three year uh, funding on this project. So three years from now, we will have good data, which is the best way to keep bees. We think we already know, but it's anecdotal and we want real science. This is our uh, veterans program. We've partnered with Delaware Valley College about an hour from us. And we are now training veterans who are coming back from serving all of us and they wanna be farmers. So uh, we have a one year certification program. Our goal is to recruit uh, from folks coming back from conflict and train them and then place them on farms, especially targeting the aging farmers across the country. There are folks out there who are having trouble getting on the tractor, but they don't want to sell their land to development. And we tell them that we can help you by literally bringing in the Marines. <laughs> so that's our program. Uh, we have funding now for, for this particular uh, group also. We, we got some of the uh, USDA money to come and, and, and help us uh, continue to train these, these veterans. Last year, about 45 minutes from the farm, there was a new hospital built, St. Luke's. It's one of six hospitals that were, are within an hour of us. And the president of the hospital rang me up and said, we want to grow organic vegetables on the farm, uh, at, at the hospital, on site. I said, that's fantastic. I've only been trying to get somebody to do that for 30 years. Good news. What are you thinking? What do you have? He said, we have 340 acres. I swear. Unbelievable. And I said, okay, we can help you, but we're not going to do 340 acres this year. But they funded this farming project. Um, we, we've hired a young woman, Lynn Trisna. We uh, pay her a salary plus benefits. She is farming on 10 acres right now, and she is feeding all six hospitals. It's unbelievable stuff, and we are so very proud of this. And we have now national interest around this program. People want to see the proposal and the documents and how we pulled this off, and it can be done. And so we're talking about farm to hospital. We're talking about farm to industrial park. We're talking about farm to wherever you have open land. We can put a farmer there that has training, including some of these veterans. Allentown, Pennsylvania, you know the song, the Billy Joel song? This is the Allentown that he's singing about, and they've been in a big hurt 
uh, for a long time since some of the industry has gone. Uh, we created a program with the mayor of Allentown and we're calling it Organic Allentown. We are growing in vertical, what we're calling growing towers. We're, we're growing vertically five feet up. You can put these growing towers on uh, parking lots, um, any empty space, and we're creating the growing towers. Farmers are being trained at Rodale to grow in the towers. And then we have um, farmers markets right in those same neighborhoods and the food will come out of those towers and to the farmer's markets every weekend. They're also selling into the corner markets. So there's opportunity galore. Um, this is uh, our medicinal garden that Boron, you know, the company that does the homeopathic, uh, they're sponsoring this space for us. This is our two cents program. We created this three years ago. We have companies that put two cents, literally two cents every time they sell a case good. We've raised about $120,000 so far. And I will tell you that if you know somebody that wants to transition to organic, or you know somebody who is already in transition and needs a little assistance, we have money available at $5,000 per grant to help those folks through transition and help those folks into transition. So if you know somebody, tell them to go to our website, look at the Your Two Cents program, make application, and we have the ability to send them some money to help them through that tough time when their soils are depleted. And uh, we've been lucky enough to partner with Amy's and UNFI. Here's our ASC program. You know what CSA stands for? Ours is agriculture supported communities. We just flipped the words around. We service 185 families in three underserved areas of Reading, Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Reading. We deliver food. We take payments by the week. No lump sum. They don't have it. But they do have their SNAP card. We swipe their card and hand them a big bag of organic vegetables every week for 26 to 30 weeks, depending upon the season. Here's our apple orchard. Here's our very robust uh, compost yard, one of the tenants of organic agriculture. Here's some of the smaller uh, types of backyard compost, our greenhouse operations that I mentioned. We raise about 65 different vegetables and lots of small grains, corn and soy, wheat, rye, and so on. Here's again our pastured livestock. We do some small scale livestock, some of the backyard chicken keepers. Uh, some, again, some of our um, small scale uh, hog operation. One of our Nigerians, and of course we had go very small livestock. And we do consider our earthworm and vermicompost and vermiculture as part of our livestock operation. So our, our key research, two things really, our farming systems trial, and how are we on time? 15. Okay. Our farming systems trial, Bob Rodale, J.I.'s son, was down in Washington, D.C. in 1980, and he almost made it out the door. He was meeting with congressmen, and he almost left. But he turned around and he said, OK, what's it going to take for you to take me seriously? I'm tired of all the Snickers. This is not right. And they said, Bob, we understand your passion for organic. We get it. But where's your data? Where's your science? All the chemical companies spend millions of bucks every year to put science in front of us, and you don't have any. So he came back to the Rodale Institute and he said, okay, everybody, I know what we have to do. We need science. And so he hired PhDs and we've had PhDs on staff since then. And they designed the farming systems trial. It's the oldest trial of its kind, growing conventional right next to organic. I've had people in the industry come and tell me when they visit and they come to the site where the farming systems trial is and they say, you know, this is some of the most valuable real estate on the planet based on the information that comes out of these trials. So look at some of the information. On the far left, the yields. This is after 34 years, not three or four. 34 years. No scientist ever, anytime, globally, has ever disputed this information. The yields are the same. 
So if we're basing things on yields, and you all hear it if you're growers from the other side of the fence, they say, well, you know, organic can't feed the world. Well, if it's based on yields, neither can they. And if it's based on yields, so can we. We just do it better because we improve the soil every year. The farm at Rodale is a better farm this year than it was last year, every year. That's what organic farmers do. They make the soil. They improve it. They put life back in the soil. They don't deplete it. So our soils have gone from 0.9% when we started the trials in 1981, 0.9% organic matter to five, six, seven, sometimes, some places there's even 8% organic matter. The conventional plots where the trials are, are still at 0.9, 34 years later. They flatlined and in some places they've been depleted. That's the big difference between what we do and what those other growers do. We make more money, we use less energy, less greenhouse gases. This is one of the uh, experiments that we use at trade shows a lot. We like to take these fish bowls. Uh, that's uh, organic soil right out of the farming systems trial. We take about a softball size, uh, drop it into the water. Then we take the uh, conventional soil, about a softball uh, size ball of it, drop it into the water. This happens instantaneously. It just falls apart as soon as it hits the water. I put the timer on the organic soil and I've had it go a hundred and I'm sorry, a, a, an hour and 20 minutes without beginning to fall apart. And it's because of the organic matter. It's because of the exudates that are there. It's because of the biology that holds the soil together. So we don't have an issue with it um, flushing down to the Chesapeake Bay or into the Mississippi River and, and elsewhere. It's held together because of the biology. There's a great shot, and these, these photos have been shown worldwide. And they say a picture says a thousand words, so I don't have to say anything. How many years of conventional growing on the right? How many years? I'm sorry. It's a 33 year study of both. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, they, these are soils from the same trial. So I don't know what year these soils were taken, but that's probably 20 plus years ago. And as I said, 0.9% is what we see throughout most of the trials. So here, here are the way the trials are set up. We grow conventional using actually now uh, GMO seed. We started growing GMO corn and soy in 2008 because that's what the industry asked us to do. It's in a completely separate part of the farm. We don't sell the organic that's right next to the GMO as organic. But um, we have conventional till and no-till. We have organic legume based, that's our nitrogen source, till and no-till. And then we have manure, composted manure, till and no-till. So there's actually six applications. There's 72 different entry points into the farming systems trial. And we use the large, the same large equipment that the farmers, you know, growing on thousands of acres use. Large tractors, large combines. We try to mimic what they do out across the Midwest so that this information is relevant to them. Here's another photo that's been famous worldwide. This is back in 1995 when we had a drought. You see the organic corn. Um, outproducing the conventional. And when this particular trial started, everybody was saying, wow, I wish the organic corn looked like the conventional. Because just like that thoroughbred racehorse, the conventional works for the short term. It looks really good in the beginning of the season. But as the season goes on, the organic takes over. It looks better, the yields are the same. And what we know when there are issues of drought, out of the trials, this is data, this is not my opinion. Can I say we kick their ass? <laughs> Anywhere between 18 to 31 percent higher yields, including the Monsanto uh, GMO corn that is uh, specifically bred to be drought resistant. We beat them by between, between 18 and 31 percent. That's data, that's science, that's not my opinion. Here's some of the uh, more uh, economic 
information. But here's our side bit, side by side. Watch this one. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. J.I. Rodell wrote that on a chalkboard in 1940. 75 years later, he's still right. Now watch what happens. Here's the other side. Sick soil, sick food, sick people. This is what we're trying to fix. So here's a study that just came out in 2014. Nancy Swanson uh, from the United States Navy, PhD. Andre Liu, president of iPhone, PhD. They got together and decided that they wanted to study 22 different diseases. They chose 22 diseases. And they said, let's see whether or not there is a correlation between the use of glyphosate and these 22 diseases. And how many of the diseases showed correlation? All 22. So they chose these, and all 22 of them show correlation. So people always want to say, well, you know, it's a correlation study. You're damn right it is. There's a correlation between glyphosate and these diseases. And here's two that, that hurt me the most. Alzheimer's and autism. We've infected grandparents and grandchildren. We are generationally poisoning grandparents and grandchildren. And what scientists are telling me as I do my investigation is that it could be generational to fix this. We may be a couple of generations away from remediating this. Cancer, 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 come on. It's time to make a change, and I said it earlier, we need your help. We also uh, created a white paper last year that claims regenerative organic agriculture is the answer to climate change. I will tell you that Al Gore got it all wrong when he said global warming. It's cold right now in Pennsylvania. It was zero this morning. So climate change works. We know that there's a problem, and the problem is that there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We started out at about 280 parts per million pre-industrial age. 350 parts per million is what they claim to be in balance, and we're at about 400 parts per million now and, and rising. So very simply, take a look at the dates on these photos. See it? 2014, 2014, this is in Arizona. This is in the desert. They got a half a year's rain in 24 hours. These are catastrophic weather events. That's what climate change is. Two named hurricanes on their way to Hawaii. Tornadoes, all the same date, 2014. This was all last year. Remember the polar vortex? And, and all of you from California, you get this one. You're in a hurt. So we think we can sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And how do we do it? It's fourth grade science. It's basic photosynthesis. Green plants suck CO2 out of the air. They use sunlight energy and water and convert it into simple sugars. And the plants uh, exude it down into the soil. And the, the simple microbiology, the good, healthy biology that lives in the soil eats the candy. They eat the simple sugars. And if we protect them with the four tenets of organic agriculture, we allow that carbon to stay in their bodies long enough so it becomes part of their molecular structure and it stays there for generations. I'm almost out of time, so I want to hurry. Here are the four tenants, cover crops, crop rotation, reduced tillage, and compost. That's how we protect those microorganisms. Here are some cover crops for you. Harry Vetch has been probably the one that, that has uh, transformed the Rodale Institute the most. Here's uh, some cabbage with uh, crimson clover, beautiful row of cabbage, crop rotation, creating uh, biodiversity. And here's our roller crimper. Anybody here use the roller crimper? 
Okay, so D Doug does. He, he Doug at, at, at uh, the extension service actually has. Uh, so, I'm sorry. No. What, what we what we do is we plant the cover crop, and we roll it down, and it crimps every eight inches. So we flatten it out, we crimp it every eight inches, and kill it. And look at the planter right on the back. So we cut a furrow right through that cover crop while we roll it down. So all in one pass, we roll it and crimp it, and we plant corn and soy, uh, pumpkins and squash and so on, right through it. It's all in one pass. That cover crop, by crimping it, we kill it. And now we have that weed barrier, that nice brown carpet underneath our, our row crop. Um, here's a rolling and crimping in Harry Vetch. West Africa, this thing's gone worldwide. There are now 30 inch roller crimpers that small vegetable growers can use even on a raised bed. Uh, this is uh, some of the work that we've done over in Italy. Here's corn mid season and I'm sorry, Ben, I know I'm running over, but there's that cover crop that's now turned brown. That's the weed barrier. We don't need that glyphosate stuff. Uh, this is one, I'm, I'm gonna skip through this because we're running out of time, but Again, we, we do have a very robust uh, compost yard. We don't sell any compost. We use it all on the farm. We put it all back into our own operations. So here's what we know. If we convert globally pasture land and crop land at 40%, 71%, that's what we can sequester. So people always look at these numbers and they say, now wait a minute. How can, how, how, can it, how can it be more than 100%? This is true carbon sequestration. We can pull down 100% of current emissions with green plants and simple photosynthesis. And we can also begin to pull down the excesses. So we can take that number 400 parts per million and move it to 399, 398, and backwards to 350 where we get back to balance. This is true carbon sequestration. There's some of the information that we derive, not just from the Rodale Institute. We're talking about Egypt, Iran, Thailand. There's global information here. So again, 111% true carbon sequestration. Our white paper will be available in the booth if you want copies of it. Uh, and it's also on our website. You can download it. So again, we can we can we can take that number past 100%. So last year, I took the paper. I walked out to the end of the driveway at the Rodell Institute in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, and I started walking. And we called it the Walk for the or an Organic Planet. And I walked 162 miles, and I hand delivered it to the USDA in Washington D.C. They were very gracious. They gave us about a two and a half hour meeting. They paraded everybody into the room to meet us all. And we think that we got their ear. So this year, <laughs> we want to involve all 50 states. I'm gonna do the walk again. I just got invited to come to India at the end of September. Vandana Shiva sent me a note on Christmas morning she wants me to walk with her on the trail that Gandhi walked to Sir Albert Howard's work in Northwest India. So I'm going over there, and then when I get back, I'm gonna do the walk to Washington, D.C. And we'd like folks from Oregon and elsewhere to join us. And there'll be information on our website. Um, Annie will be in our booth uh, today and tomorrow. We would like all 50 states to have people walking and you don't have to do 160 miles if you just want to do one it's about the spirit of the walk we want you all to land in in your capitals on the same day that i land in washington dc so i wrote a little poem for you all it's called oregon <laughs> you are indisputable irrefutable and so very very beautiful and now I'm, I'm, 
I'm done in a minute. Okay. <laughs> so here's what we're beholden to. It's our children, our grandchildren, and the generations to come. Because they're going to ask a question, and we're going to have two possible answers. And it's going to be about us and about our legacy and what it is that we left for all of them. And so the question goes like this. So, were you involved in all of that? <clears throat> and some people are going to have to say, yes, I was. I'm so very sorry. And so some people are going to have to say, yes, I was. I'm so very sorry. We, we blew it. We're heartbroken. And we don't know what to say. Or the question will be, so were you involved in all of that? And we'll be able to say, yes, I was. So proud to say that I was an organic farmer. I helped start the movement. And we proved that we could do things that were previously thought to be impossible. And we did it for all of you. Thank you. All right. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Coach. That was a very inspiring talk. Tough act to follow, um, especially this time of day. So I hope you can all stay with me. But uh, again, I'm Doug Collins. I'm at the Washington State University Research and Extension Center in Puyallup, Washington. And I want to um, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be um, at Organicology. And I also want to take a minute to thank the co-conspirators in this work, so I don't forget to later. Um, project directors Chris Benedict, Andy Berry, Craig Cogger, and Drew Corbin. Um, two graduate students are working on, or Sandra has finished, Sandra Wayman has finished, and uh, Bethany Walters is currently working, so I borrowed from their work liberally for this presentation as well. And then our farmer collaborators, um, Colin Barklow at Kearsop Farm and Steve Hallstrom at Lettuce Farm. So we work with them, and they help keep us uh, on track and hopefully um, keeping grounded and, and uh, doing research that's applicable. Um, so the, as you know, the National Organic Program um, has this statement that encourages or even um, requires that, that organic farmers uh, implement tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil. And so soil is at the center of our work in, in terms of reduced tillage, organic agriculture, but also um, in that area is weeds, you know, cultivation. The, the reason that uh, we do a lot of cultivation in organic agriculture is to control weeds. So if we start to take away one of these tools, we have to um, watch that and make sure that um, we're still able to, to control weeds and grow, grow crops. So that's the soil health is really at the center of what we're doing. But in order to do this, we have these other spheres that we pay a lot of temp uh, attention to. So cover crops are, are instrumental to what we're doing in reduced tillage organic agriculture the varieties of cover crops, and then also how are we going to kill them when people, when uh, reduced tillage agriculture is practiced in conventional agriculture, herbicides are instrumental to the whole process. It would not work without herbicides. So how do we kill the, and they use the herbicides, if they do use cover crops, they're using them to kill their cover crops. So how do we terminate the cover crop without herbicides? That's, a, that's an issue. And then um, ground preparation. How do we get a transplant or a seed into the soil if we're not going to till it? And then, of course, as I mentioned, adoption. Uh, so the outline for my talk today, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, diverse soil functions. What are the, um, why are we interested if, if soil is at the center of this? Why, what is tillage? How does tillage affect soil, basically, soil functions? Um, and then I'll go into a little bit about selecting cover crops and cover crop management practices. And then spend a little more time talking about a long-term reduced uh, tillage experiment we have looking at yield, soil quality, environmental monitoring, um, soil respiration, residue decomposition, and some uh, labor. Okay, so uh, tillage is important for um, all agriculture. Uh, organic agriculture especially relies on it for managing weeds. And, um, you know, we tend to, if you are using cover crops, you're going to have a lot of residue. So it's, it's important for preparing a seedbed. It um, does aerate the soil, can help modify moisture, soil dries out a little bit faster after you expose it. And uh, temperature is important. It, by exposing the brown earth to the soil, it's gonna warm, or to the sun, it's gonna warm up a little bit uh, more quickly. 
Um, so this is this specifically the temperature issue is an issue for the northern climates trying to adopt reduced tillage uh, agriculture. We know a lot about soil quality. We know a lot about practices that in, encourage the, the different aspects of soil quality. Um, soil quality is the capacity of soil to function over a, over a long amount of time. So um, the function we're usually interested in is plant growth. And um, organisms are central to that. So these are four uh, principles that um, have been expounded to uh, help improve soil quality. Use plant diversity to increase the diversity in the soil biota. Um, keep a living root uh, growing throughout the year. This is about erosion. We don't want to lose our soil. Um, keep the soil covered as much as possible, also relevant to erosion. And manage more by disturbing less. And so it's that last one that uh, we're focusing on with reduced tillage organic agriculture. And this is from another farm um, that uh, is incorporating um, growing squash and reduced tillage uh, agriculture. This is a Cascadian home farm up in uh, Skagit County there. So. Okay, so um, looking at soil organisms, um, the different groups of soil organisms, it's important to think about what they do in the soil. You know, diversity of, of soil organisms is important, but really it's, it, we wanna have a diversity of function. So this, is, this uh, diagram shows the different size of, of uh, different groups of organisms. Fungi and bacteria are the smallest organisms in the soil, and we call those the primary consumers. So their, their function in the soil is to keep nutrients cycling in the soil. They, they are the ones that are uniquely capable of breaking down the organic material that's put into the soil at sort of that um, uh, molecular level. Um, back, uh, bacteria are smaller than fungi, so even at this very microorganism level, there's still a, a couple orders of magnitude difference between bacteria and fungi. Um, secondary and higher consumers, nematodes, those are the organisms, these are the organisms that are going to be feeding primarily on bacteria and fungi. So bacterial feeding nematodes, fungal feeding nematodes, protozoa are just bacterial munching machines. So you're not going to have the nutrient cycling if you don't have the secondary consumers to come along and eat those other organisms. And then we get into um, the shredders and litter transformers, springtails and millipedes. And they also have an important role. They, they help to break down those larger materials into smaller materials. And then, of course, the um, ecosystem engineers or the earthworms. I'll talk a little bit about the, a little bit more in detail about the last two there, the shred, uh, shredders and litter transformers and ecosystem engineers. Um, so litter transformers like the isopods and the centipedes, they um, speed decomposition through what's called an external rumen. Um, reduces the size of debris, encourages colonization, and disperses uh, materials and microbes. So we have, to, we have to deconstruct this term external rumen really quick. So <laughs> everybody knows what a rumen is, right? That's what cows have. And so cows ha are able to eat green material, and then the microbes inside of their stomach help to break it down and get at that energy that they have. Well, external rumen is sort of one of those PR terms, I think. So what's going on is the... <laughs> the um, these critters, these shredders, are eating that material and then defecating out these uh, uh, fecal um, pellets. And then they leave those and they go about their business. But these, so the fecal pellets they've, um, they've ex excreted are, are very different than the original material that went through. They're much more likely to be colonized by organisms. And, um, and that's what happens. So then the bacteria and the fungi come along and colonize the fecal pellets and start to assist in that chemical level breakdown. So then our friends, the isopods, come back and they re-ingest that material. And on the second way through, they get a lot more energy from it because it's been worked over by the microorganisms. So these, um, and then so that, that helps them, but it also encourages microorganism growth. And then they're spreading these all over the soil. So they're helping to, they're helping um, decomposition processes. Okay, earthworms are um, ecosystem engineers, so they, they actually change the physical environment of the soil to suit their physiology. And no, none of the other organisms that we looked at do that. The smaller organisms aren't changing the physical environment to, to suit their physiology. And so what's the physiology of an earthworm? Well, they're really much more like an aquatic organism than they are a land-based organism. So earthworms need a lot of water. They, they're, they're more uh, efficient in, in um, wet environments. So what they do is they move up and down the soil to try to find that zone of just right. And they're, um, by, by doing this, by moving up and down the soil, they're creating an environment that's going to be more moist and more suitable for their um, physiology. 
And this movement encourages um, soil aggregation in uh, three ways. So they're physically compacting smaller particles together to make larger particles or aggregates. And then they create their own fecal pellets, which are, are these durable aggregates. And then um, they come to the surface and they bring organic matter down into the soil. So this aggregation is what Coach showed in that um, picture with the, um, the, the soil staying together in the water. That's a well aggregated soil. And um, it's kind of like a marble effect with it allows in, uh, water and air to be able to pass into the soil. So infiltration is, is increased with aggregation um, as opposed to running off. All right, so what does tillage do? Well, there is a relationship between basically the size of an organism and how affected they are by tillage. So these larger organisms, these larger bodied organisms, the millipedes the, and the earthworms, the shredders, are completely devastated during a tillage event. Um, the, so those functions are essentially removed from the soil, at least temporarily. The function of an ecosystem engineer, they're not there anymore after tillage. The function of these um, litter transformers is, is removed out of the soil, so the ecosystem is, is changed. The other functions, the functions that bacteria and fungi do, they're cycling nutrients in the soil. Those functions aren't going to be lost. They can even be encouraged by by tillage because it, you know, it helps uh, make more carbon available to them. But so, um, but some of the functions are lost, and 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 there's these there's these mutualism and symbiotic relationships that happen between the earthworms, the shredders, and those microorganisms. So those mutualisms and synergies can also be lost from the soil. So that's that's the reason, um, you know, that if we think about the biological functions um, and we think about tillage, it encourages us to look for some uh, alternatives. And so just to kind of review, what is tillage? Uh, why, why do we want to reduce tillage? There's a lot of bad things that we may be able to um, reduce by uh, decreasing tillage, soil compaction, erosion, crusting, dust, sediment, fuel use, greenhouse gases. And then um, we may be able to increase organic matter, uh, the soil functions I talked about, aggregate stability, water holding capacity, infiltration, carbon sequestration, and field access. And looking at this, it all sounds great, but I want to kind of jump ahead to some of my data. I'll, you know, I'll tell you the story now, and then I'll show you the story, and then we'll go back over it, right? So um, a lot of these things that we say are really great about reducing tillage, they could take a very long time of reduced tillage to get to some of that. So for example, water infiltration, um, you know, aggregate stability. If we just reduce tillage for 12 months, we're probably not going to see major changes. In fact, what, we, what you will see in the data is we see some short-term shifts to more compaction when we don't till. And that's because of the reasons that, that we till in the first place. So I just kind of want to introduce that idea, and we'll come back to it. So there's just keep in mind there's a difference between long-term no tillage and then the short-term short -term reduced tillage. Okay, so um, talking just first about the cover crops, it's very important. We've done a lot of work on selecting cover crops. This is one of our uh, cover crop trials. Um, and so what we're looking for when we set out to find cover crop varieties that we thought would be suitable for reduced tillage organic agriculture were cover crops that produced a lot of biomass um, and had an early development in the spring. And, and that is related to our ability to terminate them. Um, the biomass is, of course, related to our desire to have a nice thick mulch and, and help reduce weeds. So since about 2008, this is a, a little history of the um, cover crop trials that we've done. You can see by uh, 2012, we were looking, uh, we looked at 19 different varieties and mixes, um, barley, rye, oats, vetch, peas, triticale, and then um, we, were, we looked at several of those again in 2000, uh, over the winter 2012 to 13. So we've looked at a lot of cover crops. Uh, in a very controlled fashion. Um, in terms of termination, we've looked at using a flail mower and uh, the roller crimper that Coach mentioned. So this is the um, uh, roller crimper. Um, you, we, we fill it with water to give it some more uh, weight. And, and, and as Coach explained, the idea is that it, it crimps the, the stalk about every eight inches. And so you can see what the rolled cover crop looks like there. Um, and then a flailed uh, cover crop next to it. So we had an experiment where we compared rolling and flailing. We only used the roller crimper with our grain cover crops. We did not use it with the vetch. Our early experience with the vetch showed that it wasn't effective. I know some other people have had, some, have had success, but we, um, we worry a lot about uh, vetch pods. Um, How did that experiment compare to the vetch? This experiment? The, the previous, the flare mower versus 
I'll, get, I'll show you some data. Yeah, yeah coming up. Just sort of, just, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk faster. Okay. Um, the, so that's, that's one element of the experiment is roll versus flail. The other element of the experiment is early versus late. And so um, this is the grain. So when, we, when we're talking about early and late, we're talking about the phenological stage of the plant. So with grains, there's a scale called the Zadok scale. And um, that just basically follows the grain crop all the way from seed to seed. And um, anthesis is pollination. And so that's a Zadox of 69. And uh, you know, based on the literature, we, we chose these, these dates based on other people's, people's research with roller crimping. Um, that's a, a, a stage where they've had success with rolling the crop and then getting it to stay down because these are annual crops. So they are basically wanting to produce a seed. That's what they wanna do, produce a seed and then die. So we're trying to get them right at that moment before the seed is viable. Knock them down uh, with, in the, roll, the case of the roller crimper, um, you know, put so much stress onto them that they're not able to, that they basically are going to die. And so uh, early was late anthesis for us, and late was um, early milk. So not, we're not talking about a very long time difference here, um, and it really depends on the variety, as we'll see. So that's the story with, with grains. And then with vetch, there's a scale from a paper uh, by Mishler et al. in 2009, um, a very uh, detailed way of determining what percentage of flowers there are. It's it's very interesting when you get out there and do the work because you'll as soon as the as soon as the vetch starts to go into bloom, and this happens a lot with I think with organic farmers, you don't want to have vetch seeds and you're you you do not want to create a new weed. So as soon as you see that first bloom, you'll see a little bit of purple and you'll ah you know it's it's <laughs> it's it's in it's we're gonna get seed tomorrow and and it's um when you actually go out and, and do the, the analysis, at least the way Mishler has it, it, it's a long time before from when you see that first flower to when you see a pod. So there's a lot of time there to let the plant keep growing. Um, and so we use 60% flowering as our early and then 100% flowering as our late. And again, the reason we're not going to this stage is because we don't want to let the plant create pods. Um, and we are, we were using um, just flail mowing, not rolling. From what, um, talking to researchers more about this topic, I've, they've told me that at, it's basically at this stage when you do start to get these pods that aren't viable, that's when they've had good success with the roller crimper. I still would, would like to, you know, do some of my own research to see that, at least in our climate. And what works in our climate may not work in everybody else's climate and vice versa. So we have very wet soils in the spring. And I think this is a pretty tough crop to kill when it's got all the water it needs in the soil and you're just going to roll over it. I'm skeptical. So um, we will maybe uh, try that again another time. Um, so this is what the experiment looked like. Early roll and flail has been done on the right and then waiting for um, termination with the late uh, termination that looks like barley there. So, so what we found with rolling versus flailing, um, it depends a little bit. So again, we only rolled with the grain crops and the rise are a little bit easier to kill with the roller crimper in our experience. The strider, we really liked that in the beginning because it had great biomass and it has uh, early development so you can, you can get it. it. It hits that early stage, that anthesis pretty quickly in the spring. So we liked it in the beginning. But after looking at it a little more in a controlled setting, we found that it, um, it was a little bit harder to get to stay down. So you can see the strider barley there. Those big numbers in this case is, is bad. Um, that means that it, you know, it may have looked good on the day of the rolling, but you come back the next day and it's kind of starting to stand back up. So you didn't really, you didn't really kill it. And I know other people that use roller crimpers will often come and do it two times. Um, and, and so we didn't want to, you know, it, we didn't want to do that in our experiment. So we were just doing it one time. Um, but also notice a rustic rye uh, rolls and stays down very nicely. Um, in, in 2013, there was no difference between the early and the late. And in 2012, you can see the late rolling of a rustic really, you know, zero coming back up. So we, we liked a rustic in this, in this setting. Um, and now we're looking at the biomass. Um, and this is just an average over early and late. So um, a rustic, again, putting on a lot of biomass. Um, strider, as I mentioned, we've, we've seen great biomass out of strider barley, but it doesn't roll real well. It's not. And, and this, if you look at them, the barleys have a much thicker stock at the bottom than the rise. And I think that's why. And then um, we've also had good success with the uh, common vetch and hairy vetch and purple bounties as a hairy vetch type. 
And so what, what is the, uh, to, which is the better option than to roll or to flail? Well, um, in this experiment that Sandra did, uh, she monitored weeds coming through the mulch for several weeks after rolling flame. She didn't put a crop in there, but she did monitor weeds. And um, rolling actually did a better job of controlling weeds than the flailing did, which is kind of what the hypothesis was. You would uh, presume that because when you flail, you chop it up and it's going to not um, create the same uh, weed barrier. But another take home is that uh, the weeds will come. Um, even with these large biomasses that we're able to get, you know, with a rustic, for example, um, you know, 8,000 pounds per acre, that's a, that's a lot of biomass, but still, um, you know, the, the weeds will, will make their way through. Okay, so um, this is looking at the, the question of um, development, phenology, phenological development. So this is two years of data averaged together and then um, based on growing degree days and then taking a typical calendar date. So this is really um, valuable information. And what this showed for, um, it, what it showed for the grains is that um, barley is very quick, as you can see. So um, by about 16 May, barley is, is starting. So again, the anthesis is right there at 70. And so um, barley is, is reaching anthesis fast, and then it just kind of takes off. So there's a big difference between how barley and uh, rye develop. So once they reach anthesis, rye, barley basically takes off very quickly. And before you know it, you've got seed. You've got viable seed with the barley. The rye will kind of hit anthesis and then plateau a little bit more. Um, and, and that's good from a management perspective because you don't necessarily want to roll on a day that it's raining. It's gonna, probably going to be less effective. So you, it's nice to have a little window to get out there and do the, do the work. And then you can also see that this, the aroostic variety is maturing a lot faster about getting to where we would want to terminate it about three weeks earlier than common rye. So that's been an important thing to learn. And then um, looking at the vetches, you can see a big difference with the common vetch um, really maturing quickly in the spring um, as opposed to the hairy vetch. And again, purple bounty is a hairy vetch type. But we liked these three varieties based on, on this work, so we really like a rustic. You can see a, a number of things good for a rustic. It was easy to roll. It matures quickly. Um, it had a lot of biomass, so a rustic is really sort of hitting all those things we were looking for. And then uh, common rye uh, we like a lot, and then we, we actually had purple bounty in our um, experiment uh, for a couple of years. And um, it's a little bit better uh, than the uh, uh, typical hairy vetch, the, the name variety there. Lana also, the Lana is a woolly pod vetch type. It matures quickly, but as if you remember from the biomass data, it was not, not nearly as good as the common or hairy. Okay, so um, in our experiment, we are looking at, um, so this is a di in a different part of the field, and now we're, we're looking at growing crops in um, with these different management techniques and also looking at soil quality. So we're looking at yield, soil quality, um, you know, how much time are we on the tractor, um, weeding, all those kinds of things. So the, the five different treatments that are there is our, I guess, start with the business as usual would be the flailing plus complete tillage. And we use a spader for that. And then we have um, flailing plus what we call no-till and then strip-till. And then we do the same thing with roller crimping strip till and no till. One modification we made to this after the first year is that we introduced vetch into the experiment. We originally started with all um, grains, but we, we really liked the way vetch did in our um, trial, in our cover crop trial. So we introduced vetch. And what we do is we plant vetch before broccoli. So in the year that there's broccoli, we, we're not doing the roller. We're still not trying to roll and crimp the broccoli in this or the vetch in this experiment. So when the vetch is there, we're, we're just flail mowing that, that part of it. And so you can see our rotation. We go um, grain followed by beans, followed by vetch, then broccoli, which is our, our highest nitrogen demanding crop, and then followed by grain. And so we've, we've gone to a rustic as our grain. And for the first three years we used, or for the, the last two years of the three years, we used purple bounty, um, hairy, hairy vetch as our uh, vetch there. So we have two ways of killing the cover crop and two ways of preparing the soil, and I'll show you what that looks like next. So this is our no-till. We call this a no-till planting aid there on the left. Um, it's basically just a shank uh, 
behind a coulter. So the coulter cuts the, the soil and the shank just opens up a little um, furrow to, to put a transplant or a seed in. And then this is our strip tiller. This is a Yetter um, strip builder. And this is a, a commercial product just off, off the market. Um, and so here you can see, this is one of our on-farm trials. So that's Steve Hallstrom with the strip tiller. Um, and is preparing some ground in some, uh, I think this was Strider barley. And so again, this is off the shelf. These are used commercially. Um, they're used in environments where people don't have a lot of residue. So they are, you know, a lot of the people that are using strip tillers, they either are not growing cover crop, or if they are growing cover crop, they're coming and spraying it when it's pretty small. So they don't, they avoid getting these large residues. So that's Steve strip tilling. This is Steve and me trying to pull the residue out of the strip tiller. <laughs> so, you know, it, it does a decent job of, of breaking up the soil, but um, it's just not really made to deal with this residue. And this has been a, a continual problem that, we, that we've dealt with. And again, this is a ground driven strip tiller. So it's only working the soil, um, you know, as fast as you drive. Uh, there's no PTO. It does have a very nice heavy, heavy shank so that, that it gets deep into the soil and, and opens up a nice furrow. But it doesn't do a lot of, a lot of times when you're done, you can't tell the difference between the strip till and our planting aid, our no-till. Okay, so looking, um, I'm gonna just talk now a bit about some of the soil quality parameters that we've looked at. Um, you know, so when we talk about soil quality, it's just kind of a mixture of parameters that we're able to measure. So one of the things we're able to measure is water infiltration, how fast does the water um, move through the soil. Um, it's a pretty simple test. And uh, penetrometer, this measures compaction. You know, how, how compact is the soil? How much, how many kilopascals does it take to push that thing through? Um, and, and it also takes a measurement that can be averaged over um, every five centimeters or 10 centimeters. So you can get a nice profile of how compaction changes down through the uh, soil profile. And that's, uh, you can see they're measuring compaction in, in a reduced tillage setting. Bulk density, that's just the uh, mass of soil per volume. Very standard um, soil quality parameter. You know, it gives some indication of, of what roots are up against as they try to, to expand into the soil. Um, microbial biomass, soil respiration, nutrient availability. Soil respiration, we're talking about how much carbon dioxide is coming off of the soil. Um, at any given moment. And so we've, we've measured um, soil, we've done a lot of work looking at, at soil respiration. So looking at carbon dioxide, especially in, in this instance. And we've also done some work looking at uh, nitrous oxide. I don't have any of that data today, but show you some of the data of, of just how much carbon dioxide is, is, is coming out of the soil in these two different tilled and no-tilled. What are you going to end up storing those off gases to be able to so what you can't see um, on the little cart here is called an infrared gas analyzer. So it's a little, it, on a little unit itself. Yeah, we're doing, we're just taking the meter. The way, um, the way this works is, this is called a um, closed cell dynamics, or dynamic closed cell system. So the dynamic part means that there's a little collar that this is fastened onto. So the collar sits in the soil, but when the lid is not on it, it's just open to the environment. So it's experiencing the environment as, as the rest of the soil is. And then we put that collar on, we seal it with these high-tech um, paper clips, and then, or binder, binder clips, not just paper clips, binder clips. And then, uh, but we, we get a nice tight seal and there's some foam around it, so it's, it's pretty airtight. And then we take a reading for just two minutes. So it's, it, and what happens is the, air circulates into the gas analyzer back into the chamber, and that happens for two minutes. And it's off, I'm guessing it's also calculated off the surface area of what you're... And then we know the volume of the chamber, yeah. Of the... Yeah, so we take into account all that. And uh, yeah, and you can measure the ambient CO2 just by letting the... And it's, you know, 400, 420, so <laughs> that's... Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, so another interesting thing we've looked at is what happens to these cover crops. You know, do they decompose? Is are the are the dynamics are, are different in a tillage versus a no-till system? So we've done some decomposition studies, and we're going to do more of this um, over the next two years. But in 2013, um, we had a graduate student looking at uh, decomposition using these residue bags. So these bags here are getting the in the upper right are just are getting ready to be buried. Um, sort of as they would in the tillage situation versus the other ones that are left on top. 
Um, earthworms can be coaxed from the soil with a skin irritant or um, physically removed. And so we do this method with um, isothiocyanate. And we have done this in our experiment. Um, it turns out that the place where we put this experiment is pretty sandy soil. It's a, it's a bit sandier than another area of the farm. When we did our first reduced tillage work at Puyallup, we had it in another area of the farm that was a little higher in silt. And we had a lot of earthworms. We saw big differences in earthworm populations between tilled and no-tilled. When we did it in this area of the farm, there just aren't that many earthworms at all. So we haven't really gotten any um, decent data on earthworms, but we'll come back to that um, later when I talk about sort of our future direction. So no, no earthworm data today, but it is a good method um, to, to, to get them to come out of the soil and you can see what you're doing to those ecosystem engineers. Okay, so the data looking at infiltration, um, in 2012, um, infiltration is very erratic. It, we do about five or six subsamples per plot, but even with that uh, amount of replication, it's hard oftentimes to get to see um, differences. But um, you know, in general, the the um, full tillage, the well, I guess you know the. There hasn't been a lot of consistent differences, really, is what we're seeing with infiltration. In, in the first year, one, one of the reduced tillage treatments, the planting aid treatment, uh, was quite different, but the, um, you know, just in the rolling, but not in the flail planting aid, which uh, is not really what we would expect to see. But um, in 2013, no difference in infiltration. So it, it's still, um, you know, the, we do see big differences in um, compaction with the reduced tillage, I'm sorry, so the reduced tillage is, is is leaving the soil more compact, which you know would not be a good thing from sort of a soil quality perspective. So you can see here with the penetrometer data that in the um, five to ten centimeter range, the tillage is basically doing what tillage is supposed to do. It's it's you know making a good seed bed. It's creating a good environment for roots to be able to pass through that, and you can see that clearly with the with the penetrometer. So the the outlier there is is the flail um, plus spader. Um, in that in that uh, five to ten centimeter, so um, nice differences with that. So again, this is not necessarily a good thing from the reduced tillage perspective. Bulk density, we have seen more consistent differences. Um, so this is three years of data. Um, you know, we see basically the same thing over three year period, uh, where the flail plus spader, the the high tillage event is is creating a lower bulk density. So um, you know, less soil per volume. Again, that's that is um, make basically equi equivalent to a little bit easier penetration of the of the soil by roots. Okay, so in terms of the environment, when I said environmental monitoring, what I was talking about there is um, temperature, moisture, and light. So we've monitored, we've monitored all three of those things. And this shows um, mean soil temperatures at 10 centimeters. And big difference, again, that soil is really warming up when we tilled it as opposed to the reduced tillage. And we're not seeing um, much difference between the flail and the roller crimper in terms of temperature um, in this instance. And we didn't see a big difference. In we saw no difference in terms of the um, strip till and the planting aid. And again, that gets back to what I mentioned about sometimes it's hard to tell with that ground driven strip tiller. It's hard. It doesn't look even much different than our no till. So we didn't see any difference in temperature between that. And we saw just a little bit of difference with the flail mower versus the, the roller crimper in terms of uh, soil temperature, but a, a huge difference with the um, with the conventional tillage. So, you know, if you're in uh, maritime northwest and it's cold spring, you know, you're going to look at this and say, I kind of want my soils to get warm. Um, soil moisture is, is an interesting is an interesting story. Uh, early in the spring, you probably would want to see your soils drying out a little bit faster. But when you get to the very dry middle of the summer, so we don't get you know we're in a maritime climate, we don't get rain during the summer. Um, having a little bit more moisture, which is what we found in, in the reduced tillage, is, is a good thing. You've got, you know, that mulch is, uh, that's one of the other things mulch does, is, is keep soil moisture in there. So you're seeing more uh, soil, soil moisture in the reduced tillage treatments, again, at 10 centimeters. And then light, so these are uh, little light sensors that we, we put at the surface of the soil, either completely exposed to the light in the, no, in the conventionally tilled system or under the residue in the no-till systems. And what we're trying to do there is get an idea of the wheat, because the wheat seeds are going to be 
um, induced to germinate when they see, see light. And um, you can see that the mulch does a, does a decent job of, um, of blocking light, but some light still gets through and you know, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't take a lot apparently for weeds to, to sense that. But in, it is uh, the concept of, of having a mulch to, to you know, suppress or remove light from, from the ground definitely works, but whether it works well enough is a question. Okay, so this is looking at that respiration, and um, this is always a fun day. So you know, this is uh, sometimes we're not great farmers because we're trying to be great scientists. So, <laughs> um, but this is one of those things where you know, okay, we have to till, and it you know, it's a sound, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but for us, we have to get very geared up for the day that we're going to till, and and we actually um, we till and we run out there and we we drop our uh, our pan in the soil, and, and we try to get a reading within about two minutes of when the tiller went over. And then we take a reading for the next 30 or 40 minutes consistently, and then we go on to the next plot and we do it again. And we did the same thing with the planting. We just did this with the planting aid, not with the strip tiller. So um, it takes us a, a good amount of time to uh, till eight plots is what we all we got done uh, this day. So we're, um, and we're doing it in two zones of, of the thing. So with the, remember the planting aid is just creating a little uh, two inch strip down the middle of the plot. So we're putting one of our um, collars right on top of that two inch strip and then we're putting another one in the no-till in the zone that wasn't tilled at all. And so that's the um, out of row, oops, that's the out of row versus the in row. And with the, with the spader, it's basically there is no, out, there is no difference between the out of, there's no, you know, it's the whole plot's being tilled. So you can see a big, um, bloom basically of carbon dioxide on the day of tillage. So this, this graph is showing hours um, since tillage, so through the first 24 hours. So a lot more CO2. And one of the reasons in that, in you know, the, the carbon dioxide is coming from a couple of different things. One is going to be the microbial growth, the mi microbes breaking down organic matter. So when you till, you're, you're exposing organic matter that was protected in aggregates and clay particles. And so now you've exposed organic matter and the microorganisms are able to get at that. But, you know, in the first two minutes, it's probably not a biological explosion of, of CO2. You're seeing this more just a physical release of CO2. So the, the ambient concentration of CO2 in the soil air is much higher than it is in the atmosphere because it's kind of trapped in there. So as this respiration is happening, you get, you get a lot of CO2 in the soil pores, about 100 times greater than what you feel, see in the atmosphere. So when you till that, all that high CO2 that, that's been held in those pores is released right away. But then over the next couple days, it's probably more of a biological. And throughout the whole season, we tend to see higher respiration in the reduced till, I mean, in the uh, tilled plots than we do in the no-till. So over that whole season, you know, greater tillage. This is showing just over the over the first seven days, um, the the red being the full tilled plots. Okay, so this is the data looking at decomposition of the residue. So some of the residue was left on the surface, and we monitored how what percent decomposed, and then some was buried. Rye. Um, when it's left on the surface, we don't see much decomposition. Only about 20% of the residue decomposed. And when it was buried, about 40%. So more residue decomposed, a lot of it happening pretty quickly after decomposition. But again, rye is going to have a, a high carbon to nitrogen ratio and uh, not, you know, not a lot to really speed up decomposition. With vetch, it's a little bit more interesting. We, um, you, know, you see that the, and remember, there's a lot of nitrogen in that vetch. So decomposition is basically the process by which that nitrogen is going to become made available to the, to the crop. So, um, but when we bury the vetch, we see that over really a couple of days or a week, um, all the decomposition that's going to happen happens pretty quickly. And then in the no-till system, we still saw they end up not quite at the same place, but you can see there's still decomposition happening at that, that residue left on top. It's just more of like a slow release. Um, we don't have data looking at what happened, actually happened to the nitrogen, but we do know from our experiments that you know, we can see the nitrogen is definitely getting to the plant that's grown with a, a no-till vetch situation. So we're not seeing nitrogen-starved plants where, where they had the reduced, where the vetch was left on top versus where the vetch was tilled in. We know the nitrogen is getting into the plant. Okay, so looking at yield, um, in the first year with squash, we saw a significant difference uh, with our, um, where the flail, 
spader had had higher yields. So basically, two out of three years we saw higher yields with squash, and in the one year we saw it significantly lower. Um, I think the story here is that there is we had more potential for for yield in the squash. I, I believe what happened in 2013, 2013 was um, high higher weed pressure, basically poor control of the weeds in the um, in in the spader plots. You know the weeds do really well in in that environment as well, not just the crops. So if you're not controlling the weeds, then they they actually had more of a negative effect on the, on that those crops. We we did a better job of that in 2012 and 2013, and you can see we had higher squash yields in the um, conventional tillage. With broccoli, uh, oh, and then one more thing on the squash. So among the reduced tillage treatments, we saw higher yield with the flailed versus the roller crimper. And I, this could be related to nutrients. I think it's probably maybe more related to weeds. It's just easier to control the weeds, weeds in the flailed environment than it is in the rolled environment. Once you've got that mess of, of rolled mulch, it's very hard to um, deal with weeds. So we saw a better um, significant yield with the flailed followed by either strip tilling or um, the planting aid uh, than we did with the roller crimper. With broccoli, we've uh, again broccoli is followed by vetch. It's we haven't seen any significant difference um, in any of the three years with uh, among any of the treatments. There's a lot of variability, uh, but none of the none of the differences were significant. You can see we did quite a bit better job in 2014 of growing broccoli. Um, and again, I I think this comes back to weeds, not so much soil quality. It's a shorter crop. Um, it's just it's easier to sort of stay on top of that. And um, we do do hand weeding. I don't have that data for you today, but um, the, uh, you know, it's just easier to, to, to stay on top of the weeds. And we've grown some really nice uh, broccoli in, in the reduced tillage uh, soils following vetch. And then this shows basically just that the flailing and spading utilize more fuel um, than the alternatives. So more fuel, more time on the, on the tractor with the spader. Um, and that results in a lot of the things we do out there. I tried, I tried to capture, you know, the major tractor events, and you can see some of them are just the same for um, all of the crops, like soil prep uh, for the cover crop, and then terminating the cover crop. There's a little bit of difference where the uh, flail mower takes more time than the uh, roller crimper did. But then the biggest difference is when you get out that spader versus um, the planting aid or the strip tiller. And you can see the planting aid we're we're driving on that. Uh, cub, so it's just really not using much gas at all. So if you can go out there and just put a little strip, you know, to get your um, transplant in, you're really you're really saving saving a lot of fuel. Okay, so we've done some on-farm studies, and um, we one was at Let Us Farm, uh, where they have a silt loam soil. We have a fine sandy loam soil at Puyallup, and so you know your mileage may vary depending on your soil is one of the things we've learned. So uh, we've had. Poor success with reduced tillage at uh, Let Us Farm. Um, they uh, basically in those heavier soils, we used the strip tiller there, and uh, the plants just had a hard time getting established uh, in those heavier soils. We've had a lot better success at Kearsop Farm, where they have a, a loamy sand, um, very very sandy soils there. So in uh, 2013, this is broccoli. Um, these are whole plants here. Um, and so, so a little bit higher uh, broccoli growth, and then kale. He also planted some kale. Uh, no difference there. And then last year, uh, 2014, no difference. Um, again, here we had uh, four replications, so no difference with the flail strip till. This is the vetch at Kearsop Farm that after following flail mowing um, before coming through and strip tilling it and putting the broccoli in. And this uh, bottom right shows the broccoli being grown. So pretty good success there, pretty encouraging. Um, using vetch and then um, reduced tillage broccoli. So a couple of things uh, that we've learned and where we're going in the future. There's still a lot of grower interest in this. Um, there, the grower interest comes from soil, soil quality, reducing disturbance. Um, one of the things we did at Kearsop is we, we strip tilled some ground that we didn't use for our experiment and Colin came through and planted uh, cabbage in there. So he was you know, interested in trying one of the things he did there that we'll be doing more in the future, there was a lag between when we did the strip tilling and when he planted the um, 
cabbage. And so he took uh, some of his tillage equipment and, and just did what we would call high residue cultivation. So he had some weeds coming up. He came through and cultivated that underneath the mulch before doing the broccoli. And he had really good success with that. So um, that's one of the things we're looking at in the future is high residue cultivation. Um, you know, we're trying to avoid these situations where we have just a, a plethora of weeds. But um, so growers, I think, aren't running out to adopt this yet, but they're still, uh, their interest is still peaked. Um, so thus far, we've only looked at what's called rotational reduced tillage. And what this means is at the end of the year, we come through with our spader and we spade the whole experiment. And then we plant our cash crop. And the reason we do this is because we don't have a, a no-till drill. And we're also very concerned about getting a good cash, a good cover crop, because if we don't have a good cover crop, we're not going to really have, we're going to be sort of out of business. So two years ago, we started experimenting with um, direct seeding the cover crop in the fall. And so this I just took yesterday, these pictures. Um, so now going forward, we have an experiment which will be a continuous reduced tillage. Um, or we're going to call it a conservation tillage experiment. And, and so what we won't be doing in that experiment is coming through in the fall and completely tilling up the ground. So some of those things that I talked about that will take a long time, you know, we're hoping to be able to look at those at least over the next couple of years that we have funding for. So this is no-till uh, rye planted here, and then this is till, rye planted into till ground. And they're both looking pretty good. There's, there are weeds in there, a lot of uh, miner's lettuce. <laughs> is our weed this, this year. And there's a little bit more in the no-till than in the regular till. So that's one of the things we're looking at. On the other side of it, we're also looking at more aggressive tillage in the strip. So we are going to be shelving our Yetter strip tiller for the season. And we are um, very interested in sort of a PTO driven strip tiller to get, um, we really want that clean strip, which is what we've always wanted. We just haven't been able to do it with the Yetter. So we experimented last year with a modified um, with a modified walk behind tiller to, to just strip till a nine inch strip. And we had really good success with that, you know, trying to expose that ground, trying to get some of those short term soil quality attributes, um, reduce bulk density, uh, increase the soil, soil temperature, but without turning the whole field upside down to get that just where the plant is. So that's one of the things we will be doing. Well, it'll, you know, that's something that we'll have to work out. So in the year that we have, in the year that we have squash, it ends up looking about like that. We just have one row of squash every five feet, but then the next two years we have beans and broccoli. And so we have two and they end up, they end up, do end up moving. So that's a, yeah, that's something that is uh, a detail there. <laughs> yeah, very well. Um, that's all I have. I want to, uh, our funding is primarily from Western Sarah. We really appreciate the, uh, that organization and, and we are, um, going to be able to continue this experiment for another three years. Um, we had early funding from uh, the Center for Sustaining Ag and Natural Resource BioAg um, program, and we have some cover crop donated from ProGene Plant Research. And then there are a couple of publications there. Um, one that just came out mainly on the cover crop work in renewable agriculture and food systems, and then one that's in Tilth Producers Quarterly that's not so much about our work but looks at farmers that are actually using reduced tillage um, in their own systems. Um, so I encourage you to look at those if you have other questions or want to find out more information. I just wanted to touch on a couple things real quick and then we can have time for uh, questions for, for Doug and Coach. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm Ben Bull. I work with Oregon Tilth, but I also have a joint position with USDA's NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And so I just wanted to mention what's available from NRCS as it relates to soil health. And then point out one other thing um, related to the National Organic Program on soil health. Um, so as Doug mentioned, and as we know, um, soil health is a principle of organic farming. And you see soil health mentioned in several places in the rule. And so maintain or improve natural resources, the operation including soil and water quality. Uh, the rule talks about tillage practices, um, talking about using crop rotations uh, to um, address soil erosion. Um, also in livestock plans, you have to address soil erosion concerns. Um, so I just wanted to point out some of the current discussion around this. Uh, the National Organic Program became aware of some concerns regarding the use of appropriate soil conservation practices, 
So prevention of soil erosion, overgrazing, or the way manure was applied. And so they issued a memo to the um, organic, the NOSB um, in April requesting a discussion document and feedback from certifiers related to how certifiers are evaluating soil health on certified organic farms. And so the subcommittee presented at the meeting, the previous NOSB meeting that was in Kentucky, the, the subcommittee presented summary of feedback in October. And so just some of the themes that they heard from producers and from uh, certifiers. Again, that soil conservation is a cornerstone of organic. It is included in organic system plans and inspectors do look, for, um, look at that when they're out doing an inspection. There's a possible need for some training related to conservation practices for certifiers. And then um, certifiers are, cert are currently using more qualitative methods during inspections to think about soil health. And those are sort of things like visual observation, looking at harvest records, uh, production practices. Um, and they're not using tools such as NRCS has, which is modeling soil erosion and modeling increases in soil organic matter and all this stuff. This is sort of very consistent with how the organic program works, that it's a process based. Um, and uh, then there was also a little bit of discussion about the connection to the broader biodiversity natural resource guidance, which is also forthcoming from the National Organic Program. Um, so they did identify some opportunities so some opportunity to maybe improve consistency among certifiers in how soil health and soil conservation practices are assessed when they're, during an inspection. Also a possible opportunity to do training or education for inspectors around soil conservation and potentially partnering with an organization like NRCS, which has its roots in soil conservation and those people are experts in those topics. Um, there was a discussion about possibly focusing one inspection on soil conservation every few years to sort of target that um, specific piece of the inspection. And so this subcommittee is working on a proposal that will be presented at the April meeting for the National Organic Standards Board. So that was just an awareness thing that as you know, it's part of organic soil health is a fundamental part of organic agriculture and the NOP and NOSB are exploring um, what that really means and, so, and if there's more opportunities around that. So it's sort of a, again, timely topic. And just wanted to point out that there is some financial and technical assistance available to work on soil health um, practices on farms. And so who's familiar with NRCS? Oh, excellent. This will take me one second then. <laughs> so uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service um, works with landowners through conservation planning and assistance designed to benefit soil, water, air, plants, and animals that result in productive lands and healthy ecosystems. So NRCS has been really focused on soil health lately. They've been doing a lot of promotions over the last few years, last couple of years. Um, they have a website, they make videos, and there's a lot of discussion about soil health in all their promotional materials. And I'm excited to say that recently, we just got them, the soil health communications team to come to Oregon and profile some organic farmers. And so there's now three profiles on uh, organic producers from Oregon and three profiles from organic producers from Iowa. And so that's a really exciting thing that NRCS is now featuring them. And they've had them up on their national website showing this is um, Square, Peg, Square Peg Farm, not far from here, Forest Grove, Oregon was one of the ones featured. And they're talking about soil health and organic farming, which is really cool, I think. It's very exciting that they're interested in talking about it. And one way I think producers can access that support is through the EQIP program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which works to um, implement conservation practices that address natural resources such as soil. And so just briefly, um, how that program works is producers who want conservation assistance can sign up uh, with NRCS, develop a conservation plan where they identify resource concerns, and then 
um, opportunities to implement practices to address some of those resource concerns on a farm. Uh, so a, a resource concern is a sort of a degradation of a, a resource on the farm. And these resource concerns are sort of the basis of a conservation plan and the basis of implementing other practices and getting that financial and technical assistance that's available. So the resource concerns, there's several of them that are related to soil. So soil erosion, uh, soil quality degradation, um, also plant condition. And then there are a lot of conservation practices that NRCS provides technical assistance and funding to implement um, if they meet certain standards. And so some of those practices are, are compost facilities and mulch, irrigation, nutrient management, um, pasture management, pollinator habitat, cover cropping. And so there's a lot of things very closely related to soil health that is available from NRCS. So crop rotation, mulch, conservation buffers, so sort of filter strips that could help address erosion, nutrient management, um, pest management, which would include addressing weed concerns, which is, as Doug was mentioning, is closely related to um, soil health and tillage. Uh, so re residue and tillage management, prescribed grazing. Um, so just to mention that they, the cost that's paid from NRCS is based on the typical cost to implement one of those practices and that there are uh, higher rates for beginning farmers or limited resource producers and there are oftentimes higher rates for organic producers and there's an organic scenario which for example like in cover crop would recognize the higher cost of organic seed or something like that. Um, in the general EQIP, you can get paid up to $450,000 over a contract of a five-year period. And there is an organic initiative, which is a, you would just be competing with organic producers. And it has a lower um, contract limit. It's $80,000 over several years and $20,000 annually. But uh, if you were doing some things like cover crop and nutrient management, you could still get a lot of support at that level. Um, and so the practices have to meet certain specifications. So it's not just cover crop in any sense. It's cover crop as defined by this. And so there'll be certain um, rules related to when you can terminate them or when you plant them and those sorts of things. But in general, it could fit into the system. And here just was one example of cover crop. And it, see, some of the purposes are to increase soil organic matter. Um, recycle nutrients, weed suppression, and so a lot of things that we were talking about fit well with, within the purposes there. And just to give you a sense of how the payments work, this is the, this year for Oregon, the payment schedule for cover crop. The, so this is the estimated cost, this is what you would be paid, and it's based on how much they estimate that it would cost. And so you can see the OI is for organic, so if you were doing a general purpose cover crop organic, it's like $133 per acre. That cost is including seedbed preparation, seeding operation, and the actual seed. So just to give a sense of what would be available. And the, you can sign up year round, but there are um, ranking deadlines, cutoff periods, and there's one coming up for Oregon March 20th. And so there's still time to go into the local NRCS office for this year. And you can just contact your local office. Uh, you can find the contact information online. And also NRCS is going to have a booth here. The Oregon office is going to have a booth here this weekend. And so you could talk with the NRCS folks that will be here as well. And we have the state agronomist from NRCS in the front row, too. <laughs> and um, this is a new flyer that we have out, out, outside on, our ta on the Oregon tilt table as well. But this is a, just the type of um, assistance that's available also to help producers transition to organic from conventional. So this is NRCS assistance that's available. So it's also someone designed it not in a standard USDA government look, <laughs> which, is equal, which is equally exciting. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I would, not necessarily questions for me, but also for Doug and Coach, as we have time here, if you guys want to jump up so you can answer on the microphone, that would be great. So open up for questions. Yeah. Is this enough to 
Yep, and I'll repeat the question, or people can come up to the microphone up here if, you, if you're close enough to. Yes, question in the back. Yeah, we, we don't have a lot of uh, experience with it. Um, the question was, <laughs> thanks, Lindsay, uh, what kind of equipment would you use for high residue cultivation? And it, it's just, a, um, I'm, not the, I'm not the weed guy, but uh, I, I have a picture of it in my mind, but I can't find the name for it, but just a sort of a heavy, heavier duty uh, V-shape, you know, that's going to go just cruise maybe like an inch under the soil. So you, you got to get under the residue, but you also have to get un, under the soil and, and, and just something with enough um, power to, to, to cruise under the mulch and, and under the soil and, and get those weeds. So as, as opposed, you wouldn't be using a weed basket. You know, that, the weed basket, you want to have a very nice, you know, I, and this is why adoption is difficult because you cultivate that soil, you, pre you prepare it, it looks beautiful, you seed the crop, you, you've got nothing but brown. And then you've got a little, you know, hopefully you've got your plant coming up there down in a nice row and everything else is a weed and you can just come through with multiple different tools and keep disturbing the soil and keeping those weeds down. Uh, in our situation, it's very green <laughs> and then it's slowly turning brown as the residue dies. You can see your crop and then what's happening eventually, unless you, unless you have an incredible amount of mulch, you will get weeds coming through. And um, we're intrigued by the high residue cultivation because I, I, one of the reasons we haven't done a lot with it yet is because we don't really, haven't really thought about when will it work because our soils are, are so wet, you know, early in the season. But I think when it will work would be in like August in our situation. And especially as we're looking toward this continuous no-till, we're really going to try that this year when it's, when it's gotten very dry and you're not irrigating in that space, you can come through and, and do something to knock those weeds down. I, again, I don't have the experience with. It. I mean, with, yeah, with the with the roller, you you might have better luck. Um, this is something that people used also in instead of a roller crimper or in the early years of uh, no till, is they would use this kind of technology to try to kill the cover crop. And so then you're cutting un, right underneath the root. You're trying to cut the root of the cover crop. But the problem is it it's a there's too much soil moisture for it to be effective. When people were doing it in the spring, so the the crop would reroot. So I think in the in this instance, you may drag some mulch. We'll just have to. That's something we'll have to experiment with in our situation. Like I don't know if it'll if it'll work or won't work. Uh, maybe you know, in the it might work better in the flail. This is one reason we're very we're we're seeing flail mowing as an easier thing to get to adoption through. Just because once you flail mowed, you still it seems like you still have options for tractor cultivation. And, and from our experience with the roller crimper, it's hard to picture how we still have options for tractor coal. You can obviously go out and pull weeds, but we would like to reduce that. <laughs> so I, mean, I, don't, I hope that helps. I think with the flail mowing, with the flail mowing, I think, I think you could do it later in the year when the soil's drier, because it won't work if there's still soil moisture. We don't have one, but we're, we're in the market. So and Doug, yeah. your oh, there, oh, sorry, why are we not including a drill <laughs> seeder so, um, in, in our trial? So we, we do um, drill our cover crops, but it's not a no-till drill. So we have a very nice John Deere drill, and we, we get beautiful cover crop stands, um, but it's not a no-till drill. We actually used it this year as a no-till drill. And the conditions were just perfect when we went out and seeded. So this is something. So we planned for this, too. So we grew a summer cover crop of Sudan grass to, um, so, you know, to, to try to have a – to transition into this. So, we, you know, we didn't just leave it weeds out there. We, we planted a summer cover crop. We had a beautiful Sudan grass. We cut it, like, three times. And so there really weren't very many weeds. And Sudan grass will winter kill. So we mowed it again. And then the conditions were just perfect for planting. And we've, again, we have a fine sandy loam. And so we were able to take this just regular drill and, and get the seed in. And it, it worked really well. It, the difference is a no-till drill would do a better job of the, the drill we had was on this particular day was able to open up the furrow and put a seed in. A no-till drill would do a better job of closing it up. So the drill we have is designed to it's it's you know it's it's thinking that you've, you've got nice tilled soil so it just it has like these little um 
loops that just drag behind and they, it doesn't take much to cover the soil in a tilled situation. So a no-till drill does a better job of closing that, that back up. So we will have one by um, this fall uh, when, we, when we continue this experiment. Well, um, so explain more the, about can I explain more about uh, <laughs> carbon dioxide respiration? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, does it make roots grow? Um, you know, Coach actually, it, it gets back to photosynthesis. I think uh, Coach showed sort of the basic um, carbon cycle. Um, there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants take it in. Um, so then the sugars are, are going into the soil, as Coach, as Coach mentioned. And then it's the microbes in the soil, the bacteria and fungi, are converting those sugars into biomass. So they're gonna take some of that carbon to make their own bodies, but in the process, we, we have what's called respiration. Um, you know, it's just like when we breathe in and then and we breathe out, the, the, the air we breathe out has more carbon dioxide, so we're all part of the problem. Um, so the air we breathe out has more carbon dioxide in it than the air we breathe in. And um, that's basically what's going on in the soil. So that elevated CO2 in the soil um, I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think, you know, plants are probably adapted to it, but um, it, you don't have the same kind of gas exchange. Uh, gas exchange is slowed down a bit because of the soil itself, so you can get sort of pockets of, of higher CO2 uh, in the soil atmosphere. I'm not sure what that means on a sort of a mass balance scale. I haven't, you know, lower. So he the comment was that lower uh, organic matter soils have higher respiration. I... I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, there's, we've, we've tried to capture that initial bloom of CO2, but I think, you know, again, I mentioned that was probably a physical process, but then what we're also interested in what's, what's happening after that. And so what's happening after that, we have higher soil temperatures, we've exposed a lot of organic matter. And so we see more respiration throughout the whole season. So that soil is not, you know, it's not, you're not really sequestering, you're not sequestering carbon as well as you could in a reduced till system, if you're tilling it, you're break, you know, you're you're exposing organic matter, and then we're talking about a biological process. And I don't know why I would that would be counter to what I would assume that you know, um, but maybe this it has to do with management or something. Uh, so the question is, what's the fate of the CO2? Um, you know, the CO2 we're measuring is I you know with the method we're using, I think that CO2 is going into the atmosphere. Um, Probably, you know, and on our little experiment, it's probably not, you know, it's not affecting the global CO2. <laughs> no, I, no, we're measuring above the mulch, so we're measuring above the soil. In, bo in, in both instances, we're measuring CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. So, yeah. The question is, did we fertilize our trout plots? And the answer is yes. We use a, a organic feather meal fertilizer. We use, um, we take into it, we give credit for the vetch. So. Um, you know, we're we're trying to match the plant's need, and then with the broccoli, we're giving credit for the vetch and 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 putting down um, a little extra, and then with the squash, we're putting down some. We we've done it by hand thus far, so we're basically doing it um, after tillage and after strip tillage. Yeah, and we're and we're working it into the ground, whether you know, in a little narrow strip, basically across all treatments. Yeah, I'm sorry. The question is. Um, in describing the rolling and crimping and the um, killed uh, cover crop, do we still get uh, weed pressure and how do we respond to it? And so, uh, yes, we do. How do we respond to it? We, we live with weeds because it's the Rodale Institute and those are all uh, research plots. And so we use the weeds as another indicator of how well our cover crop worked, how well the roller crimp, or the same, same as the uh, research that Doug is doing. And I think there's an overwhelming need for more research. So what happens, as Doug said too, you know, what, what happens in, in Oregon is different from what happens in Pennsylvania. The cover crops are different. Uh, the timing is really critical for the roller crimper. And if you, if you miss the timing, uh, when that plant goes to seed and whether it, that, that seed's ready to germinate when it hits the soil, then you get weed pressure. We also have areas where uh, we have um, water that comes in and kills cover crop. And then we have tons of weed pressure because there's, there's no weed barrier there. 
So we just uh, live with the weeds in, in most cases. I mean, our, our whole issue with the roller crimper, number one, it was invented at the, roller, uh, at the uh, Rodale Institute. Uh, Jeff Moyer, uh, you know, he's been there 38 years. He was responsible for creating it. And so we rely on it most. But we would like to see a situation where we could regionally talk about uh, the timing issues, the cover crops that work the best, you know, what works in, in, in dry land doesn't work in areas where there's lots of rain. And so we, we need a lot more research and uh, NRCS uh, could help in that regard as well. If you're, if you're not working with NRCS, my suggestion would be uh, seek out uh, your, your NRCS agents. They have been uh, outstanding to us and, and been very helpful to every single farmer that we've referred them to. So I would give, uh, give Ben a call and, and, and find uh, ways for uh, you to work with them. I just want to make another comment on the mulch versus weeds issue. Um, so the, this is something that in the research community there's been a lot of discussion about. Is there a magic number that if I get this amount of biomass, then I'm going to suppress all of the weeds? And so, you know, 7,000 pounds per acre, 10,000 pounds per acre, 14,000 pounds per acre. These numbers have been thrown around. And there's a really interesting um, paper where they looked at, at this very question and they don't really answer that question, but they have a lot of, you know, equations and everything for mulch thickness versus uh, uh, the amount of mulch there. And what if you really drill down into that paper, the answer is it depends on the weed seed. So for some weeds, it takes very little, like 2,000 pounds per acre to, to suppress that weed. But for other weeds, you get up into like 20,000 pounds per acre because it the, the weed is a larger weed or whatever, like it... The, I'm not, again, I'm not a weed scientist, but it's just, it can make it, it will make it up through that. So there, um, it really depends on the weed and, and that's, you know, it's going to depend on, on your environment. And the other comment I would make on that would be uh, Ron Morse, who's a real pioneer in organic reduced tillage. He talks about a period of rotation into reduced tillage environments. And the biggest thing you could do would be to do practices to really try to knock down your weed seed bank you know, before you sort of went into this. So that, like, that's what we tried to do with the Sudan grass. We just did it for a year. There's a lot of other things you could do, like stale seed bedding and all this stuff. You could really just try to, to, to get that under control. Um, but if you just make sort of a big change from, I, I was doing it this way and now I'm going to try it this way, yeah, it may not work. We're slightly going over time, but there was a question in the back. You had your hand up a couple of times. Uh, we haven't seen any issues, no. The question was, are there any issues with germination, germination uh, in particular with rye as the cover crop? We haven't seen any issues, no. We like rye. It works really well on our farm and, and vetch. Those are the two that we use. And I will tell you, as we talk about, you know, needing more research, I mean, just on our farm, on 300 acres, there are places that vetch doesn't work and rye does. And there are places that rye works and vetch doesn't. So... Uh, we need a lot more work, and, and um, anybody that wants to be one of those on-farm sites and participate, you know, we'd be happy to talk to anybody about that, too. Ridge, ridge, crap, ridge cap tiller. I, no, I think that that's a little – so ridge tillage, or, or yeah, that, that's not what we've been doing. That is a, li a little bit differently, where you build a ridge, um, and then I believe you cut it, up, oh. cut it off in the, in the spring – yeah, we, we have an experiment with that, but that's another, uh, would be another alternative, re reduced tillage method or conservation tillage method. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks very much. Everybody.